Hello everyone, this is Matthew Corbin. Welcome to today's video. Today we're going to be talking about something that I saw just the other day. It's an article from the New York Times. It's an opinion piece written by a certain Peter Adderton, and I, I may have mispronounced that name, and if so, I do apologize. The article is called a God problem, and it claims that there is something logically incoherent about the concept of God. Let me just preface this by saying that I am not a philosopher, but I think that just about every issue raised here, every supposed logical inconsistency with the concept of God, can be explained away fairly easily. It's because certain philosophers believe that God cannot logically exist does not mean that there is anything truly illogical about God. God can in fact exists, there's not anything logically incoherent about the concept of God. Alright guys, so let's jump right in. We're going to just look at this article piece by piece. I'm going to try to explain how the things that I believe are wrong, and I don't think that they're bringing up valid points against the existence of God. I'm going to skip over a little bit of the text here. I would read all of it, but I'll link in the description of this entire article so you can read the entire thing. Let's first consider the attribute of omnipotence. You've probably heard the paradox of the stone before. Can God create a stone that cannot be lifted? If God can create such a stone, then he is not all-powerful, since he himself cannot lift it. On the other hand, if he cannot create a stone that cannot be lifted, then he is not all-powerful, since he cannot create the unliftable stone. Either way, God is not all-powerful. The way out of this dilemma is usually to argue, as St. Thomas Aquinas did, that God cannot do self-contradictory things. Thus, God cannot lift what is by definition unliftable, just as he cannot create a square circle or get divorced, since he is not married. God can only do that which is logically possible. No, I think I would have to agree with this approach, because it's what makes the most logical sense, that God can only do what is logically possible. However, I would not say that God cannot lift an unliftable rock, simply because I think that the impossibility here is that an unliftable rock, which even God cannot lift, simply cannot exist. So to argue the solution to that problem isn't that God can't lift an unliftable rock because it doesn't make sense logically, but rather that a rock unliftable by God cannot exist. I think the key here is that your idea of an unliftable rock that even God cannot lift, that's what doesn't exist, not that God doesn't exist. God is all-powerful because he can lift even the rocks that are unliftable, not because he can create something more powerful than himself. I think the argument that because God can't create a rock that even he can't move makes him less powerful is a little bit flawed. Like I said, I'm no expert, but I just don't think that it's really a logical way to explain how God doesn't exist. To say, well, God can't do something that would be greater than him. Well, obviously, because he's a greatest. You can't get greater than God. It's an impossibility for the unliftable rock to exist, not an impossibility for God to exist. At least, that's how I view the problem. For example, can God create a world in which evil does not exist? This does appear to be logically possible. Presumably, God could have created such a world without contradiction. It evidently would be a world very different from the one we currently inhabit, but a possible world all the same. Indeed, if God is morally perfect, it is difficult to see why he wouldn't have created such a world. So why didn't he? But he did initially create a world in which evil did not exist. When God first created this universe, it did not have evil in it. But God gave us the choice to turn away from him and evil came into the world. Why would he give us the option to do evil? I think that may be what you're asking. Why would he do that? Well, it's simple. God wants us to choose to love him. You know, the Bible oftentimes uses the symbolism of a marriage to describe the human relationship with God, or at least what the human relationship with God should be. And in a marriage, no one in their right mind, no one who is, uh, I would say, morally perfect, and I would say no one who is all-knowing and omniscient, I don't think anyone who is both of those things, which God is, perfect and omniscient, I don't think that they would want their spouse 
to only be married to them because they were forced to. You see, God loves us enough that he allowed us to make a choice as to whether we wanted to serve him or not. The evidence of the scripture points towards that even the angels have a choice. I think oftentimes people think of angels as just God's little minions or God's servants who just do whatever he asks, and they are. They are God's servants. They do, in fact, do what God asks them to do. But they too have the choice to move away, as the scripture indicates about fallen angels. Even angels have that choice, because God doesn't want them to be like robots. God doesn't want them to say, oh, I love you, but they don't really know what it's like to choose to love him. He wants us to make that choice. And he created Adam and Eve perfect. He created this world perfect. But some angels and the first human beings made the choice made the choice to turn away from him and to turn towards evil. I believe that him giving us that choice, that him giving us a free will, is related and I would even say a major part of the fact that he is morally perfect. He did what was right by allowing us to have that choice, by allowing us to have that freedom to choose whether we wanted to love him or not. Yes, it is possible for God to be both all-powerful and to be morally perfect. God is morally perfect, and he did initially create this universe to be perfect, but he wanted to give us the choice whether we love him or not. Next, the author goes on to critique the idea that God is omniscient. They claim that it's highly implausible that God knows all the facts in the universe, no matter how trivial or useless. I don't know if God... Uh, does keep record of every single thing in the universe. But the Bible does tell us that his eye is on the sparrow. Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean that it's implausible. So, you know, you can go ahead and say, oh, that's that, that's completely ridiculous and throw it out the window if you want. But there's nothing ridiculous about it. We are limited on how much we can know and how much we can learn. And, and you know, we're limited with our abilities, but he is unlimited. Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean that it's implausible. If God knows all there is to know, then he knows at least as much as we know. But if he knows what we know, then this would appear to detract from his perfection. Why? There are some things that we know that, if they were also known to God, would automatically make him a sinner, which of course is in contradiction with the concept of God. As the late American philosopher Michael Martin has already pointed out, if God knows all that is knowable, then God must know things that we do, like lust and envy. But one cannot know lust and envy unless one has experienced them. But to have had feelings of lust and envy is to have sinned, in which case God cannot be morally perfect. I think this in itself is entirely wrong as well, because you're forgetting that God is all-powerful. And even though we may not be able to know what envy feels like until we ourselves are envious of someone, doesn't mean that God doesn't have that ability to see through other people. You see, it's worthy to remember that God sees our souls. He sees our spirits. God can see inside of us, and not just the physical things inside of us, but God can see the very core of who we are, I would say. God can see uh, what we're feeling. Just remember that God is all-powerful. Now, the Bible doesn't lay it out entirely, but I think that to say that God doesn't have access to this knowledge just because he doesn't have personal experience with it is wrong, because he sees everything that goes on in everyone's life. He's watching every single one of us, and I think through that he knows what these certain things are like. He knows what they are. And a lot of the next few paragraphs in the article are basically arguing about the same thing. Or saying that God doesn't know what it feels like to hurt someone just for the sake of hurting someone because he's never done it. But we think they're leaving out of the equation that God is all-powerful. Like I said, the article just goes on to continue to argue about these things. I'll talk about a few more things that they say in a... Uh, in, the, in parentheses, they have a whole paragraph that's in parentheses. I want to read that and sort of answer some of the questions that they pose here. I shall here ignore the argument that God knows what it is like to be human through Christ, because the doctrine of the Incarnation presents us with its own formidable difficulties. Was Christ really and fully human? Did he have sinful desires that he was required to overcome when tempted by the devil? Can God die? Was Christ really and fully human? The answer is yes, but he was a little bit different from us because we know from the Bible that he was born of a virgin. He was not created in the exact same way that we were, but he did have a human physical body. He did have a human nature. I think the best way to put it is that Christ was a lot like Adam when he was created. 
Adam also was not created through the typical method of a man and a woman. Adam was created straight from God, straight from God's own hands and God's own breath. Jesus Christ came strictly from a woman, without a man being involved, and through the Holy Spirit moving on that woman as she conceived. So yes, Christ was really and fully human, but he didn't have the sin nature. And that's that sort of answers the questions about did he have sinful desires. See, he was a lot like Adam, that's the best way to put it. When Adam was created, Adam did not have a sin nature. Adam did not have the sinful desires to do wrong. He did not want to do wrong. He did not want to sin. Similarly, Christ, even as a man, was perfect. And both Adam and Christ had the choice to turn away from that. Adam was given the choice in the form of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And if he ate of it, now he would have natural inclinations to anger, natural inclinations to envy, to lust. Now he would have the sin nature. Jesus Christ, we know from the Bible, was tempted by Satan. And he was given that option to do wrong. But he didn't. Jesus Christ didn't have sinful desires, but he was tempted. To be tempted is just to simply be given... A Choice. I think that's the best way to put it, at least in the way that I'm using this word, and the way that I understand it as is being used in this article. When you are tempted, it means that you're simply given the choice. Someone is trying to lure you to do wrong. Satan tried to make Adam do wrong, and Satan tried to make Christ do wrong. Adam did do wrong, Christ did not. And as for the question of can God die, the truth is that no, God cannot die, but humans can die. That's actually why, or at least I think a large part, of why Jesus Christ came. Because God, in his form, cannot die. So he had to take on the form of a human, including the human nature, but not the human, natural, sinful nature. That's why he was born of a virgin, because if there had been a man involved, he would have been born with the sin nature. Because it was a Holy Spirit that moved upon a woman, he did not have the sin nature. He was a human, but maybe you could say an irregular human. He did not have the sin nature, but he did have the human nature and a human body. So even though he himself cannot die, that human body that he took on could die, and it did die, as the Bible says. But remember that even when his human body died, Jesus Christ's soul lived on. And his human body would later raise from the dead three days later. So yes, God cannot die, but when he takes on a human body, that human body can die. But even when the human body does die, God does not cease to exist, as his soul and his spirit still continue on. And it's worth noting here the doctrine of the Trinity, which states that God actually has three different forms, we could say. One is consider the Holy Spirit, the other is commonly referred to as the Father, and the other is referred to as the Son. So even if one of them takes on a human form, which one of them, the Son, being Jesus Christ, did, the rest still continue to exist in a godly form. Well, folks, that's all the time we have for today. I know this video wasn't the best made, or it was probably wasn't the best well-done video I've ever seen, but I just wanted to make it very clear that there are not logical incoherencies regarding God and His existence. It's still possible for God to exist. I don't pretend to be an expert or a philosopher or a scholar. I don't pretend to be that. I'm honest with you, okay? I'm not any of those things. I'm just someone who wanted to uh, come and just tell you what I think is the truth and explain something that's very important to me and explain how I don't believe that there are any logical inconsistencies regarding the existence of God. So based on my current upload schedule, I think my next video should be due... May 15th, that was half a joke, but seriously, I'll try to upload on May 15th, and I do have to apologize for not uploading for so long, I'm not even going to try to to make excuses, but um, I'll see you on May 15th, I hope, and hope that you enjoy this video, I uh, hope that God blesses you, keep fighting the good fight of faith, and remember that God loves you, and he's never going to leave you.